Three Men in a Bible, Exploring the Sunday Scriptures. Join Father Panagiotis Boznos, Nick Leonis, and Stephen Christoforou for their weekly Orthodox Christian Bible study. They're three friends who hang out every week and explore the Sunday Gospel in Epistle readings. Are we live yet? Being live streamed. Did you didn't get the the Zoom notification for your privacy? No, I did. I, did I? I didn't get it. Why didn't I get it? I want to. I want to. Zoom doesn't care about your kid. privacy. Oh, That's man. big tech for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're live. Here we go. There it is. I just like to pull it up here, so you can watch yourself. Yeah, mostly because I look. I'm 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 mirrored here, and I want to know what it looks like to not be mirrored. What do other people oh. see? Mm. Oh, my parts on the other side of my head. Oh. Huh. That's 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 not what I see. I I think I look weird. Not in the mirror. Like what I see all the time when I look in the mirror is this. But when I like see myself on screen, I think I'm weird looking for obvious reasons. But mostly because Nick, I never see you looking in a mirror, but I always think you look weird. Well, Bother but you me. wouldn't if you wouldn't if if you were facing me in the mirror, if like you and I were standing next to each other and there's a mirror in front of us, you'd be like, oh, that's how you should look. Because what I, that's what I think when I look myself in the mirror. And then when I see myself on YouTube, it's like, oh, no, I'm backwards. Hmm. Okay. Steve, you want to weigh in on this? <laughs> My first thought was, uh, isn't Man in the Mirror like a Lionel Richie song or something? That's no. Not Michael Jackson, man. Michael Jackson. Oh, oh, terrible. I'm sorry. I feel bad. Oh, man. I feel bad. Ugh. I feel anyway. Dirty. Yeah. Sheesh, Lionel Richie. It, it, it was him I was looking for. This is, for this is how you but... pretend. This is how you pretend not to be old. Uh, I'm going to make a reference uh, and pretend I don't know what it is. How do you do, fellow kids? <laughs> Have you heard of uh, the Beatles? I don't know. Wow. Wow. Tell us about uh, what episode number is this? This they have news. An anniversary of sorts. Good news, everyone. This is the 50th episode of Three Men in a Bible. Wonderful. What yeah. is the, does this make it our, is this a jubilee? I believe so. All, all the, the, the debts of everybody who's watching is now forgiven. Warning mm. may not be honored by your local bank, but... <laughs> I was counting on that. <laughs> Make sure that all your servants can go free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have to let the crop, like the fields rest for a year as well? Yeah. Right? Can't, can't plant anything. Can't plant here. For a week. It's just for a week though, because this isn't the year of Jubilee. This is the episode of Jubilee. Uh, so next week we'll be back on 51. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next week we'll be back to extracting from the earth. We are nerds. I love All how right. Andy uh, I'm acting. Like, yeah, it's the 50th what anniversary. Is the, what is the 50th anniversary gift? What, I, what should I have bought the two of you? I, I prefer the paper anniversary. Just with paper. Oh, like, like paper, like greenbacks. No, no, just paper. Oh, just paper. Like get a ream. Like a good, like some good stationery. Yeah, no, just a ream, just a ream of paper. Just, just, yeah. That's, What's the, that's uh, I, think, I think that's the first anniversary is paper, isn't it? I think so. Would cardboard the, count for that? I don't know. Don't give me that recycled stuff, though. I want like the right off the tree. Do you want to? Do you want a watermark or no? No watermark. Are we? Are we? Are we springing for the linen? Paper? All right, we should just get we started. Just... We're gonna be out here right at right at five, if not earlier. So we've uh, we've exhausted our time by starting late. So I'm gonna start with a prayer. Here we go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Shine Amen. within our hearts, loving Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your gospel. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that, having conquered sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ, our God, are the light of our souls and bodies, and to you we give glory together with your Father, who is without beginning, and your all holy, good, and life-giving Spirit, now forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Shifting up the whole, the whole scope of the show here. Now that, uh, now that I can delegate to some of the, you know, the junior clergymen, 
You didn't delegate to me. I took it. I just, oh. I just took it. You snatched it. That's Three right. men in a Bible yeah. is brought to you by Manager Tools. <laughs> Can we reference uh, another podcast during our podcast? I think so. Would you like to I learn was, how to de- delegate? Watch Manager Tools. I was actually asked to give a presentation to our clergy syndesmos about delegation. Well, that's from the that's authors good. of The Effective Manager. Then I did. Then I did Slack message my assistant and say, um, "By the way, I have this presentation coming up. I want you to write the first draft." Perfect. How much of this is made up, and how much of this is real? Uh, you guys know. are you guys are really sponsored. Sure. Be, yeah, I'm gonna. This is I'm gonna so, sponsor this is so the much office of vocation and ministry. <laughs> office of vocation and ministry. Let me turn. Let me turn the cap around so I can show it off. For those of us listening to the audio version, none of this is coming through to you. No, no, only murders in the building. There's another pod show about a podcast. Mm. Then there will be a fan, a fan podcast about the show about the podcast. Sounds good. Let's read the Bible. Podcasts all the way down. Here we go. This is from uh, Saint Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter four, six through fifteen. Brethren, it is. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Christ, so that the life of Christ may also be manifested in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to the death for Jesus, for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith as he had who wrote, I believe and so I spoke, We too believe, and so we speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that the grace extends to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. So, Father Nick, since you're running the show today, no, I did all. I, I did my part. It's your turn. Oh, <laughs> mute. Did you say? Could we say that you're delegating that to me? Uh, no. That tickles no. your fancy. How effective, Steve? I love how you're holding up a book that you have not read. Totally, I haven't cracked that spine. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mint condition. Mm. I brought I it up because like, I was going to look at the one-on-one chapter, actually, because I'm getting into that with my team, and I have yet to read it. Okay. Yeah. I feel like everything we're saying right now is falling flat among us. <laughs> yeah, we haven't had a good a good rift yet. We'll we'll no, find it. Just, we'll find okay. it. Yeah. I think it's because we've changed the dynamic. The uh, things are things are off. Things yeah. are off. Paper anniversary. So, so we, uh, we jumped, right? Because last week we were in, uh, we were in John's first uh, universal letter. And now here we are in the uh, second, Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. Um, well, the reason why we were in John's last week was because it was his feast day. Yeah. Correct. This is the 15th Sunday from Pentecost. So this is the apostolic reading for the 15th Sunday, mm-hmm. just to set it in context. So we're now back on that regular cycle, just proceeding straight out from Pentecost through um, not affected by any other feast days, not affected by any other celebration of the church, just um, the regular liturgical cycle. Yeah. It's funny though, that like we just hit us like a streak of feast days that have altered the readings like August, like, like the Panagia was on the, was on a Sunday. So that mm-hmm. changed what we normally would do. Mm-hmm. The beheading of St. John the Baptist was on a Sunday. That changed everything that we normally do. The St. John the theologian that was on a Sunday. So like we, 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 gotten these we're gonna hit some like, in, november in and out too. of rhythm i'm sorry i said we'll hit some in november then it's the uh, entrance of the theotokos on uh, right. the 21st is a sunday this year yeah right so 
but you know, in any given year, you know, you, you notice these things, these things tend to happen. Yeah. We just hit, I feel like we just are hitting them a lot in succession right now. For those listening in the distant future, this is the year 2021. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> well, you know, you and your post-apocalyptic wasteland. It's going to be, it's going to be like, play, play this back like, in five years. Right. Well, I was going to say, it'll be like a uh, flight of the Concords. Sorry, this we've wasted the year so much time. 2020. The, the, the distant future, the year, the year 2000. 2000. <laughs> Sorry, we wrote this song a long time ago. <laughs> that was my bell. I'm not going to answer it. Um, so anyway, we're in, so we're in we're in Paul's uh, second letter to the Corinthians. We are going to yes. stay on this right for the for the foreseeable future um, because this is now we're kind of back in the normal in the normal normal rhythm like we were saying. Um, I mean. Uh, I can't remember. Have we have we done a little intro into Corinthians? Do we want to start with kind of? Like we haven't picture? done Second Corinthians for sure. Um, I don't know if we've done anything in in first, but I know this is the first time that we'll be discussing um, Second Corinthians. Yeah. So, Steve, do you have an intro you would like to give us? Um, I mean, you know, so we know, we know that there are at least the way that the books of the New Testament are presented. We have kind of two letters of uh, Paul to the community of Christians in Corinth. Although we can probably read between the lines and uh, see that there were probably more letters than that actually sent. It's just kind of the way that they've been compiled. Mm -hmm. um, Paul had a particularly um, difficult relationship with the Christians in Corinth. Um, you know, he, he refers at one point to like the sorrowful letter that he, uh, he writes to them. I mean, he was, he was kind of rejected by them. I mean, there's, there's a very, there's a kind of a history of, uh, of tension and drama there. Um, and a lot of the stuff that, uh, you know, Paul writes about with the Corinthians is some, some kind of immorality that was happening in the community, some, uh, wolves that were leading the people astray, um, and, you know, when we get, when we get to second Corinthians, which is what probably the combination of like the third and fourth letters i mean depending on who you ask right we're kind of like we're sort of late in this in this life cycle in terms of like paul was rebuked by the corinthians at one point i mean it's a it, it's a it's it's a tumultuous relationship with a uh, a stiff-necked uh pagan people right corinth is this uh this uh city in greece known for its uh immorality and its leather uh <laughs> and paul is you know going to great lengths to try to get them back on track yeah, and it spills over even after this into into Clement, who's who's I believe mm. the third um, the third bishop of Rome, and Clement has to write a letter from Rome to the people in Corinth because they still can't get it right, and most of it has to do with um, most of the issues there. There's some, as, as he said, there's there's rampant immorality that is around the community, and then infecting the community as well but in addition to that a large portion of it is uh based around leadership and who is who are the people that were rightly set up as the leaders of the church in corinth this is the problem in uh in first corinthians there's still some uh, a major hint of it um in second corinthians where um paul's paul's position is being undermined um and his role as the the founder of that church um, is being challenged by other um, other leaders within the community. Um, and then by the time we get to Clement's letter a couple decades later, uh, the leaders of the church, the official church sanctioned leaders have actually been ousted by a smaller sect. And then Clement has to get them back in charge of the church there. So um, there's a lot of leadership and most of that, those leadership problems um, are based around in the in first Corinthians, you know, a more, uh, spiritualizing, uh, maybe more Gnostic approach to the gospel. Um, and then in the second, uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, it's really about his role and his authority, um, yeah. as a, as an apostle. So he spends a lot of time in second Corinthians, essentially justifying himself and the message of Christ that he brings. And as a result of that, you know, some of the most famous Pauline, uh, lines that we have about himself come out of this because he really has to make the case to the Corinthians um, for himself for, that he is a legitimate apostle um, that he's he's equal to the other twelve uh, that were uh, 
ordained by Christ or present at Pentecost. Um, and that, you know, the message he brings is a consistent message with them. And that there is no difference between those apostles and himself. So he, he spends the majority of this letter kind of justifying his, his position. And as a result, um, focusing on the unity of the church. Mm. But isn't like first Corinthians just all about love? When we talked about love last week, didn't you get enough? <laughs> Can never get too much love, but, um, <laughs> But no, so there's so there's well, there's a depth to these books that is beyond uh, just one chapter. Um, yeah, which I think is I think, but I, I think that's really kind of important to touch on all the things that you're talking about. That's what the themes of these these books, these two books or letters, um, and whether they be a combination of letters, are about. There's, I mean, it's and I think when we talk about letters, because I know that we talk about the apostolic writings, um, but the epistles are often written in relationship and this one is a great example of like what is going on in this relationship between paul and the church of corinth and all the issues that go on with with that and then we reading that yeah. us reading this in a 21st century context need to understand that there's a relationship there yeah and, and 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 conflict right the conflict that emerges in that relationship like honestly i kind of i think that that the the stuff that comes up in second corinthians in particular is very applicable to our modern moment because um like the internet makes authority a weird thing in the 21st century um and and some of these questions of like authority and the place of the church and what the church is i mean sometimes i think that our modern moment is actually kind of similar to this like first century kind of confusion when people didn't really have things like figured out um online so i don't know in, in terms of just kind of like some of the issues that are in the air today in the 21st century in 2021 to those who are listening from the distant future distant future yeah the year 2000 um yeah i think i think i think you know i don't know in my mind like second corinthians in particular kind of like speaks to some of those things and what are some of the issues you see at hand in the the, the present year of 2021 well do we want are we going to like zoom out from the pericope do we want to kind of like think of second corinthians as a whole or um we're going to spend time in second corinthians so we'll get we'll touch on the okay. on the entirety of it but you know you you mentioned i think the when we get into the text of today like when we start diving yeah. into the text of today's reading we'll see essentially what you're what you're talking about reflected in that that's that's the main point of what what is happening here um what is presented right out of it pulled out of it as part of a larger argument set within the right context we see what is actually happening right because we can we can approach this this uh reading and miss all of that but with with that context it gives us a new a new perspective or a clearer perspective right so fine we'll skip we'll skip the zoom out and we'll just zoom in um when it says, uh, you know, brethren, it is God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earth and earth and vessels. Paul is using the, the royal we, speaking in the plural about himself, right? It is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has, shine, who has shown in my heart to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God, right? So at the very beginning, when we set this in the context of there is there are issues over Paul's authority within Corinth, mm. he is first and foremost starting, and this is again part of a larger context within the entire letter. But he's saying that it's God who gave him authority, right? This is not an authority that he derives from himself, and that is something that he will criticize in this and also in 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 First Corinthians a, a little bit. Um, that, you know, first Corinthians has those lines, but, you know, some of you say I'm from Paul and some of you say I'm from Cephas and some of you say I'm from Apollos, right? Um, St. Paul is making the point that the authority in the church actually does not rest in him, but the authority comes from Christ, who is the light that shines out of darkness or the light that shines in the darkness. And that quote, um, it's not a direct quote. And, uh, you know the the scriptures tend to do this. They don't they don't quote directly. They they paraphrase to drive you to that that uh, passage. So you mean says, not, not even verse, you mean, right? You mean, the larger you context. Mean Paul didn't open up his Bible and pull out from verse from Matthew and say, "I mean, like, yeah, yeah with, because with numbers, what he's, 
because what he's what he's quoting is actually will not be will not be recorded and written down written down. <laughs> it's right. in the oral tradition, but it won't be right. written down for another thirty years, forty years. Right. 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 But what he's referencing is the opening of the Gospel of John, where the light shines in the world, um, and or light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overtake it. Right. This is the preamble mm -hmm. to Saint John's Gospel. It is all about identifying Christ. Right. And so not only is it the God who speaks these words, right, who inspires these words, but it's the God who actually is the light that shines out of the darkness, right? Um, St. Paul is beginning in this verse, establishing his credibility. Where does his authority come from? Mm -hmm. And then in relation to that, what is Paul's relationship to, to that? And there you get the next verse. He's an earthen vessel, mm. right? He's, he's, he is not, you know, he is not a strong container for lack of a better word i mean he's he's clay and so the authority doesn't come from him it comes from the god who is the light that shines out of the darkness that has shown in him and he is an earthen vessel then brings that forward why yeah. to show that the transcendent power belongs to god and not to us yeah so this those verses up until that point before we get into the the affliction those are all about establishing paul setting himself in the proper relationship to God to establish that his authority comes from God. And as such, it's not Paul. It's not him who's making these claims. It's not his gospel that he's preaching. He's preaching the gospel of Christ. And he received that through his baptism, through his vision of Christ, through, yeah. through his life lived in prayer. And actually after we get, you know, we get through this, we won't get to it in this section, but we get the famous words, you know, like I know a man who, you know, was caught up to the third heaven, right? His, his experience of standing in the presence of God and experiencing the kingdom in its glory, that's, that's where he gets his authority. His authority doesn't come from man. It comes from God. And just to prove that point, we are all earthen vessels. We can't, we can't really have authority of ourselves. That authority comes from God because we are weak. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, right? Because even, even the, the way that Paul sets up his authority, very much you can find a connection between that and, um, and the way that God presents himself through the prophets of the Old Testament, right? I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, you know the, the classic example that comes to mind is, you know, God calling Moses, right, to go in front of Pharaoh, right? And Moses has like the speech impediment, that God is constantly sort of doing things through people with their own sort of limitations, because the point is not to have the glory sort of rest in these people, but to point back, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the great king, you know, the sort of model king of Israel is David, who made a lot of mistakes, right? Lusted after a woman, got her husband killed. I mean, like he becomes this sort of, you know, the quintessential king of, uh, of Israel. God is constantly working through deeply flawed people because the glory is not theirs. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like the authority right. comes from God and the glory then points back to God, which is the reason why Paul can be so self-effacing here. Right. Like and he, and he talks like and and that's the thing that becomes proof of his apostolic ap apostolic apostolicity being an apostle. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but he, he's not pointing to his success. Right. He's pointing to the ways that he is humble and broken for mm -hmm. the sake of the Lord. Um, and that's, that's so hard get. to do, though. That's so hard to like read a little bit. It's almost, I mean, because he needs to establish authority. It's, it's in a letter. They know who he is. They have a relationship with him, but yet, you know, with all the other things that are going on with all these other people who are kind of stepping up and we hear more about that um, uh, as the book goes on, but, or letter, um, but to have to defend yourself, but also do it in such a way that the glory is not mine, but what I have to say is his. Like, listen to me because I have what I'm, what I'm conveying to you is God's that is, that's a hard thing to, to have to do. He has to establish himself as an authority. And at the same point in time, make it clear that he is not the source of his authority. Yeah. Yeah. He, He's got to yeah. stand up for himself in a humble sort of way. Right. Yeah. He's not up there beating yeah. his chest and patting himself on the back. He's, you know, <laughs> I am an earthen vessel. I am kind of like shards mm -hmm. of, you know, shards of shards of pottery. I'm trash. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm this trash that is speaking to you with the voice of God. Mm -hmm. And um, anyone you talk to who, who 
works in, in public speaking or, or coaching or anything like that will, will tell you that being upfront and clear about your flaws actually gains, gains trust in a, from an audience. Mm-hmm. But what's, what's important is that they need to believe that and see that and know that it's, know that it's true. Because all too often what you get is the feigned attempt at what Paul was doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to, sh- I'm going to share just a smart, like, I'm going to try and relate to you because I'm, I'm flawed too, but I'm not really, but like, it's not really either that, that uh, much of a connection or it's so f- like passing that it doesn't actually make me feel connected to you, but it's, it's clearly like a perfunctory attempt to try and connect with my audience. And that's, that's not what happens here. Paul actually just spends so much time about his flaws and suffering throughout mm-hmm. this, this entire book, right? And we take second Corinthians as a whole. Um, he spends just so much time on it that it, you, you, you know how important it is to him, right? It's not just one. It's not just, you know, let me drop this in there so I can try and pander to you and relate to you and, you know, let you know that, you know, I'm, I'm a normal guy too. Like those are the worst sermons, right? Like here, let me, let me show you that I'm a normal, let me drop a sports reference in there because I'm a normal, I might be a priest, but I, I know what football is. Um, anyway, sorry. To... That struck a nerve. <laughs> <laughs> One time we were texting in our, in a, a group of friends about, uh, sermon styles. And I went off on this rant about how I hate this one particular style of sermon. And then one of the priests on the thread was like, that's my bread and butter. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. So yeah, let me tell I'm so relatable. Let me tell you how relatable I am. <laughs> Hello, fellow kids. <laughs> I, I, someone, someone, someone like asked me, are you the type of priest that, that like, like comes out with a starts with a joke? Like, no, no. Sometimes I say something that's funny. It's on accident. Hmm. It's not on purpose. <laughs> it's, but I, I, I don't go for that. But the, the point is, Paul is being authentic and real with his community about who he is and where that comes from. He's not giving them, he's not feeding them a line. Mm-hmm. He's not feeding them like, I know this will make me sound better. He truly and honestly believes this. He truly and honestly knows that through his suffering, he is gaining a crown that he has nothing to boast about, right? As yeah. we'll get into other, other sections, you know, he says like, I have, you know, I, I boast in my weakness. That's it. That's all he can do. And he truly and honestly feels that and believes that. And that's, that's different from using a tactic to connect to a community because it's a rhetorical tactic versus desperately wanting to communicate a point to these people and and that being his ultimate desire yeah which is when you go after people who are building themselves up you are following after false prophets yes. when you rebel against the people that the church has set up um you're rebelling against christ when the people that the church has set up have built their you know their persona on being the source of their own authority then their false prophet like he needs us to understand all of this yeah and because it's 2021 and we're on the internet we we do need to understand each and every one of those lessons <laughs> you know and, and the thing is like it's a theme yeah. i mean it is is the thing when you to, to zoom out just a a, a bit mm-hmm. right i mean like this he it's something that he harps harps on continuously throughout this letter i mean there's the you know, to, to the point about the suffering, like, I forget what chapter it is off the top of my head, but he enumerates it towards the end of the letter, mm-hmm. chapter 9, 10, 11, I, I can't remember exactly where he's like, maybe 12, maybe 12, ah, I'm so close. Um, you know, he, 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 he rattles off the I was, you know, beaten within an inch of my life, I was lowered 11. in a basket, Sorry. 11. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like he, as he's contra- especially as he's contrasting himself with these other sort of these wolves, right? These false, false so-called apostles who place themselves in authority. He's not like pointing to his success. He's just like, I was beaten, I was stoned, I was shipwrecked, right? Like all of these things I did for the sake of my love for you and the sake of my love for Christ, mm-hmm. because I'm this empty vessel who's constantly pouring himself out, and that at the end of the day is the reason why he is an actual prophet and an actual apostle, as opposed to you know 
an influencer to use kind of modern terminology. Yeah, you know, I think the hard part being, okay, so like being a priest, right? Or even having this like, this podcast, I find myself, I'm very, I become self-conscious after I say something like that may, might be, I don't stupid. know. Stupid. Yeah, stupid. <laughs> Uh, but I, I'm, I'm very self-conscious in that, that, and, or, I mean, as someone who is speaking frequently in front of people, um, doing classes or giving a sermon or whatever, mm -hmm. when you speak as much as you do as a priest, mm -hmm. I pray that everything I say is sound and non, you know, non, doesn't, doesn't hurt anyone in any way. Um, but I think at some point in my imperfection, I'm going to, sure. and by basically saying and coming out on the offset, like right out, right out the gates saying, basically don't follow me, follow Christ. And I'm a representative, I represent Christ, but it's not me. Like when I screw up, that's me. When, when I say something stupid, that's me. When I say something awesome or like gets you, hits you in the heart, that's not me. So I'll take all the credit in the world for all the stupid things I say, but none of what the, the real good stuff I say. And in some way or another, even that though, is a little relieving. Mm. Because we do carry a lot of weight in what we have to say. And I don't want to represent Christ in a bad way. And, I, and really at the end of the day, I can't. I mean, I can but like th those are me. Those are the me parts. They're not the Christ parts. The par Christ parts are the parts that are, are, are positive and, and right. Yeah. And I think, I think this connects a little bit with what we talked about last week, if I recall, like, you know, what it is to, to be members of his body, right. And to be kind of his hands in the world it might be confusing when we talked about it, but I think we've talked about this before. You know, like to, to the extent that, that, that anything good has happened through this earthen vessel, right? That's Christ at work. Um, and all we can really own at the end of our, uh, the days is our sins, right? I mean, his, his, his point towards it, it at the end of that big paragraph there, that like life is at work in you, that Jesus is manifest in our, in our, in our mortal flesh, that the, the glory of God comes through these broken things because we are members of his body. And, you know, that, that's why he's not going to boast of the number of people he baptizes or the number of whatever. He's going to boast of the weakness that opens the door for, as he says in Galatians, right? That it's no longer he who lives, but Christ who is living in him. Um, right. You know, it's again, it's such a weird way from the, the normal way that we talk about authority to us to assert that authority. He's not out there being like, you may remember me from such films as blah, 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 or, I'm you know, McCoy. point, right? He, he doesn't, he's not doing that. He's not pointing to the stuff that he's good at. He's pointing to, he's pointing to the way that he's humble. And, and what are the things that he, what are the things that he values for, for, for Christ, right? It, like you said, it's not, he doesn't value the work that he's done or the accolades. Not that those things are unimportant, right? But in terms of his own salvation, he doesn't value any of that. What he values is, and this is, this is, I think, a big tie into last week. He values his suffering for Christ. That's the only thing that matters to him in terms of, forget establishing authority. When it comes to, when it comes to asking Paul to talk about himself, tell us about you and who you are. He goes immediately to all the ways that he suffered for Christ. That's what he wants us to know. Yeah. Which is, which is, which can come across a little bit as complaining and he's not. Um, oh, clearly not. No, but, but he's not coming across as the, uh, you know, we do this still today where someone who wins boasts, right? Like, you know, you score a touchdown, you go nuts. You, um, you win something. Who do you think you, you are? I am. <laughs> the bowling right. guy. Remember? Oh, it's the it's one of the best boasts in like sports history. It's so ridiculous. I'll, I'll send you a YouTube link. Oh, jeez. Um, but but there's but there you know he's boasting in like I I I'm boasting in death 
that the death is defeated by Christ. Like, again, it's, it's, it's all this level of, um, it's not this glory, like, but it, it's so much, it, it's so easy to love the winner. And I think that's what we see. It's so easy to love the winner. And uh, Paul is almost calling himself a loser. But a yeah, loser but no, in, 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 in earth in terms, in, in, in worldly terms, he's sure. a loser. I'll, and what I'll he keeps that. pointing people to is something that's beyond that. And that's what like, so yeah, like, so yeah, all this stuff happens, but, but still there's more. That's what I think like his authority is not in the worldly glory. Cause, and, and, and that's where we draw a lot of authority still to this day. Are you a lawyer? Are you a doctor? Are you a, this, or, you know, are you whatever? Um, are you making money? Are you, th- these are the things, are you a celebrity? Um, where we draw our attention, the bright lights, the exciting things. And Paul is constantly saying, yeah, that's, that's what, what you think is awesome is, is garbage. And what you think is garbage is where you're going to find awesome. Hmm. You disagree? Go ahead. No, no, I don't. I want to spend a little bit of time just kind of back in the text because we've been speaking a little bit generally Generally, about around around the text instead of going directly into it um so this conversation about authority through um through suffering uh comes from the section um immediately afterward where saint paul says that you know uh we have this treasure in earth and vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to god and not to us and then he goes on and says we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, <clears throat> always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Um, so again, making the, making the point that not only is this how... St. Paul, you know, defines his authority or describes his authority. But this is, this is the example of Christ as well, that worldly glory is rejected for um, suffering, right? Mm. Which is why the, the traditional, uh, you know, in our, in our, icono- in our iconography, the Stavromen of the, the icon of Christ uh, crucified, the charge above his, above his head uh, the traditional Orthodox writing is, is the King of glory, not, you know, mm. Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, which is the historical, but the King of glory. Um, and St. Paul writes about this, obviously in, in first Corinthians, um, that God uses the, the foolishness of the world in order to shame, uh, the wise. Um, and he speaks a little bit about, about this in second Corinthians as well, using that same term, like a fool speaking foolishly and things like that. Um, but it's this rejection of, it's this rejection of worldly glory for the truth of, for the truth of the gospel. Um, and when it comes to how this is manifest in St. Paul personally, like I said, this is, this appears again and again and again throughout uh, second Corinthians where he's making the case for his um, authority based on his suffering, not based on his yeah. glory, but based on his glory, his suffering. And as we yeah. said, we see that in, in chapter 11 uh, where he's, you know, again, talking about his credentials. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, which I just referenced. I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons, more frequently in deaths. Often from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned three times. I was shipwrecked at night and a day. I have been in the deep in journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, uh, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren, in weariness and toll and sleepiness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. 
the mm-hmm. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. And then he actually goes yeah. on and gives even more detail about the things that he's he's suffered. Um, so just to, to make it clear, right at the very beginning of that passage that you quoted, Father, like the they that he's talking about is that other faction, right, or those false right. teachers that he's mm-hmm. he's comparing mm-hmm. himself to, because. Mm-hmm. They're out there sort of boasting of themselves, their effectiveness, right. whatever it is. And he comes in and totally subverts it by listing his shipwrecks and his beatings and all that sort of stuff. Right. And he, he speaks uh, a lot about shifi- sufficiency. Uh, and that's another, another term that comes up in this section, which again is born out. You know, what we read in this epistle reading is one one example from from Corinthians about St. Paul establishing his authority um, through his suffering and in relation and how that shows that he is not the source of his own authority, but it actually comes from Christ because all he can all he can boast about is, is his suffering. Um, and so if we look in chapter three, um, verse four, we see and and we have such trust through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. But our sufficiency is from God, who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter of the spirit, um, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Right. So he's talking about, I have this authority. I'm sufficient. I can do this because God has given me that, because God Mm -hmm. has made me sufficient. And he uses that same term again in uh, chapter 12, when he's still speaking about his own personal suffering. He's speaking about his thorn in the flesh that he asked God to remove. And God says to him, quote, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, this is now St. Paul again, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproach, in need, persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. Right. So he's making the, the point that when he suffers these things, the grace of God abounds within him. And therefore, he's sufficient to perform the task and the ministry of an apostle. But it's almost as if, if you look at St. Paul, without these sufferings, you aren't sufficient to do that, Mm. Mm. right? If you have not endured hardship for Christ in the gospel, then that grace does not abound in you, does not give you the power and the authority to go out and to speak. Yeah. And, and this is something that I think we see in a variety of ways in the tradition, you know, because I think you can, you know, because because Paul is talking about sort of in a very literal sense, the beatings and the and the and the difficulties that he encounters. But I think you also see something similar in, um, you know, in the monastic literature from St. Anthony the Great and, you know, the, the battles and the privation that he had sort of in the wilderness to St. Silo on the Athenite in the 20th century and the 15 years, like lacking consolation and enduring the sort of spiritual darkness after he has this vision of Christ and then just has nothing, right? And is sort of enduring, and is enduring, you know, just despair, 15 years of despair, um, which is the thing that then shapes him to be the person that he is, this modern day father, Um you know, and because and, and that I guess is the is I think to highlight even that word that you brought up multiple times, sufficiency, right? That maybe the 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 the, the thing that those sufferings reveal is that it's not like it's not the consolation or it's not the sort of second order feeling that that motivates us, the feeling of pride of somebody's applause or the feeling of peace that we get from like a moment of prayer or whatever it is, like the thing that really motivates us is we are perfected in this moment is just the, the presence and the communion with Christ himself. It's not these like second order things, right? It is him. He is the thing that is sufficient for us. And I endure 15 years of despair and no consolation in prayer because I want him. I don't simply want the warm and fuzzies of prayer. I want him. I endure 15 years of beating and cold and so forth because I don't want a nice warm bed or whatever. I want him. And the fact that these people want him rather than these other consolations is what makes them them. So this is kind of a weird question and I don't, I think I know the answer to it, but would you say the hardships that one endures is a prerequisite for preaching or prerequisite for reaching people or is it, or is it helpful? Is that all? I mean, you know, it's definitely helpful. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I think that the reality is, 
suffering is a part of human existence because we are separated from God and we are fallen. So I'm going to say yes, but I also don't want it to, I don't want it to sound like a masochistic, like we have to, it, you know, impose, but to a certain extent, we do impose hardship on ourselves, freely chosen for the training of our, our souls and bodies, right? That's, that's what the aesthetic life of, life of the church is, is freely chosen hardship for the training of, of our soul and body, which I just said. Yeah. Do you say that well, one more time? Um, so, I mean, the aesthetic life of the church is, is freely chosen. I lost it. Anyway, um, so could, could you, but could you, could you say in, in part that when we view something like a Joel Osteen or we view, so, I mean, like, like, like when you look at, and they're often targets, uh, these televangelists that um, live in, you know, luxury or even, or, uh, you know, I'm conscious of certain things that like, would I like x y or z sure but i also understand that that also can give a negative message right and all not only just negative message but like what am i doing what are, where am i putting my hope where am i putting my 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 time talents treasure into and then going to tell people you know this is how we should live a little more humbly right like like i should live humbly I'm, we should all live a little more humbly but i'm not going to we should all, you know, like, oh, you, you're, you're struggling with the suffering of losing someone or whatever, or not even just losing someone. You, you know, you're, you're doing the right thing, but at work, um, but you're, you know, and I, but you got to stick with it. I've never gone through any hardship whatsoever. Like, like those things make us better when we're living it. So St. Paul's living it. And if these Corinthians uh, are to live it, they're going to experience it too, regardless of, you know, it's not a prosperity thing. It's, it's yeah. a, this is life. I'm in it with you. And yet there's more. I mean, I don't know. Is, is that kind of what we're seeing here? Maybe there's two layers to it, right? Maybe, maybe there's the sort of the, the ascetic layer of somebody who has been through these difficulties again, is changed as a result of this, you know, because the, the, the Paul who, goes through, you know, all of these years of the difficulty is, is different in some sense than the Paul who like, you know, is, is riding on the, uh, you know, on the road to Damascus, right at the very beginning of his ministries, right? Because we continue to sort of grow and we continue to be shaped to be shaped by all of that. Uh, but also maybe it's like a way of thinking about this as almost like a proof or a sign or some sort of other reassurance. Um, because when we see some, when we see an actual apostle who's going through these sorts of things, like their motivations are a little bit more clear. Right. Like, like, I don't think anybody could look at Paul and question his motivations when the poor guy was like shipwrecked and so forth. Right. Like one of the difficulties of some of those like prosperity gospels, for example, example, is that like their, their motives can very easily be impugned. And that casts like a really big shadow over the gospel as opposed to like, Paul is clearly doing it for the right reasons. Like he was beaten to within an inch of his life three, four times, as he tells us in chapter 11. He wasn't out there for the fame or for the clicks or for anything like that. He was doing it for Christ and that's all that mattered. Well, and yes, he was doing it for Christ, but the end of this passage gives, makes that even more, more clear, mm. right? It's actually for it. Yes, obviously for Christ, but it's for everyone else's for sake. Your sake. Yeah. It's for your sake. That's, that's how this passage ends. It's for your sake. So this grace extends to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving to the glory of god right it is for the glory of god but it's also for the salvation of the people around him right like those are his motivations he's going to endure whatever he can endure for the salvation of the people around him and thereby glorify god yeah like the, again this is this is what we came to as really a conclusion last week when we talked about love right that it's it's he's going to just suffer willingly and he's going to actually boast in that and only in that because in that he can show true love, right? It's not about letting, it's not even about, because we've been speaking about authority. And I think this is a good, a good way to tie this to last week and to lend more color to this. It's not about establishing authority so that it makes sense, right? It's not about legitimacy in the sense of like, I've suffered this much, therefore listen to my message because I have more clout because mm -hmm. of my suffering. Right. It's suffering based in love. I will endure all of these things 
because I love God and I love you. It's for your sake and for the glory of God. That's why I'm doing all of this. That's the real source when we you know, talk about his standing and his authority in front of the community. The suffering is the witness to it, really. The suffering isn't even the source of it. The source of it is first and foremost his great love for Christ and by extension his love for his brother. Mm-hmm. And as a result, he'll endure anything. And really the suffering is the sign. It's the witness to the love that existed first and that's the source of authority. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 this passage, I'm not going to lie, is a little hard for me in that, like, how do you justify yourself as an authority without complaints, sounding like a complainer? I suffered so much for you. Um, or sounding like... Um, uh, boasting in almost as if like you're like you uh, like you said we're not like there to hurt ourselves so that we can have this clout and and then I think we're explaining this out and it makes sense but it's just I think Saint Paul here has a really hard task and then but and at the end of the day what it comes down to I think correct if I'm wrong. And we haven't really touched, I mean, we, we've talked about where the authority comes from, is that this is an imitation of Christ. That God suffered and and he loved so much that he uh that he suffered for us and for our sake. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and then we have the saints, Saint Paul, who suffers as in as an image and, and living out Christ in him. And then now what happens to us? And not just to, you know, okay. Yeah, we can talk about the Corinthians, you know, 2000 years ago, but now for us, as we look around our churches and we see icons of the saints and we see icons, uh, you know, we have icons in our homes and we name our children after saints and, and we have all this, these are people who suffered like Christ. And now we as Christians have to suffer like Christ for the next, for, for the, for who, for the sake of those around us, that they may see and live in Christ too. So it's, it's this level of, um, pay it forward of suffering. Um, but pay it forward of, 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 of beyond suffering of life that comes in abundance for love for the other person. Right. And I think that's where, again, to, to go back to last week, Nick, to your, to further strengthen your argument, when, when we're in first John, you know, he says, you know, for, you know, we love not because we love because Christ loved us first or God loved mm-hmm. us first. Mm-hmm. Right. And then we, we mentioned this last, last time that then because God loves us, we are able to love with his love through being united to him in the sacraments, right? right. That it is an imitation and not even an imitation. It is a bringing forth and a manifestation of the love of Christ who laid the foundation by suffering for us on the cross. And then St. Paul, when he boasts, even his boasting of his infirmities is in fact boasting of his union with God. Yeah. Right. Cause and maybe that, maybe that takes us back to the first verse, right? Cause the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, which is manifest in the face mm-hmm. of Christ, mm-hmm. right? This is manifest in the face of the suffering servant. And it is manifest in those who are themselves icons of Christ who are imitating their Lord and following him and picking up their cross and doing the same. Well, I think uh, I think we can probably cut it off there for now, right? Right. I got nothing yeah. else to say. I'm done. No, I don't either. I, Thus I, endeth I, the jubilee. I can. All of your debts are reinstated. <laughs> Pay up. Uh, uh, thanks for having me on the show this week. It was nice to to hear you guys talk and try to parse this out while I sat here and listen um but uh in that being the case that we're closing it out father paniotti will you uh close us in prayer sure in the name of the father and of the son of the holy spirit amen amen oh christ our god we give you glory along with your father and your all holy spirit we thank you for bringing us together today to study your word we ask that you place your light within our heart that we may shine it out into the world for your holy always now and forever into the ages of ages amen amen 
See you next week on a very not special 51st episode of Three Men in a Bible. Three Men in a Bible, exploring the Sunday scriptures. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio.